Hey everyone, Jason Shepard here of M0A.com taking more of your questions in this week's Ask Jason a Question segment. These three questions all came in via Snapchat on video. Let's take a look at the first question together. Hey, what's up, Jason? Can you make a video on takeoffs and landing distances? I'm having a hard time interpolating. Is there some kind of formula to get an exact number? Thanks. So takeoff and landing distances are always tough because especially as it pertains to the new written test, we went from PTS to ACS, remember, but even on the new written test, they still give us this basic takeoff and landing distance chart. Even though you may do it differently in your Piper Warrior, your Cessna 172, your Cirrus, inside the POH, how you come to the answer for takeoff and landing distance is different. Yet we have to learn this one generic one inside of the written test, and that's the chart you see actually on your screen right now. It's our this basic takeoff and landing distance that gives us the associated conditions and everything else here. Now his question was, what happens when we have to end up interpolating? Okay, as we get to the end of this, and I'll explain how to go through this very quickly, but you get to the end of this, and sometimes you compare your answer with the three possible answers for the written test, and you're thinking, do I round up? Do I round down? Do I get close enough? And it does take some interpolation on that part. It takes some interpolation through the different temperatures, you know, from Fahrenheit to Celsius and everything else. Follow with me on this chart here real quick. We always start down with our temperature. We'll just use their example um, with, uh, with this red line here. We start down with our temperature and let's say it's, you know, it's right about here. We read straight on up now to our pressure altitude. Upon reaching our pressure altitude against this gradient line here, we go straight on across to what's called our reference line. From there, we parallel the nearest line on down until we get to, in this case, our weight. Once upon hitting our weight, and this is where some interpolation come in, because this line is taking a different slope than this line, yet you're kind of approaching this line uh, as we go down. So we work to make our, uh, the most exact line that we can, some interpolation needed there, and then straight on across to our reference line. Now we get to our wind component. Do we have a headwind? Do we have a tailwind? And we continue on down to that line and straight on across. Then the obstacle height. Do we have an obstacle? If so, we parallel that line up and out. If not, we read it straight on across. And then even so, it takes more interpolation because these are, look at these chunks. 1,000 foot chunks here, just divided up by 500 feet in between. There's no other line. So is this right here, is this 2,000, you know, 350? Is it 2,200? We don't know. We have to do some interpolation. This is why the FAA has gone out and tried to fix this a little bit on the written test, the ACS side of things, but it's very difficult because there is some interpolation. It's certainly a best guess. It's certainly the method of you know, measure twice and cut once. Run through this twice and see what you come out with, with some different variables to make that best guess, because I know a lot of those answers, A, B, and C on that written test, are very close. Unfortunately, this isn't always how we do it in the real world. I know we have iPads that do it for us, but more, more certain, this isn't the example we use in the actual aircraft. Your Cirrus is different. Your Cessna is different like we spoke about. So we're learning this chart, which is really arbitrary to you specifically in your flying, but we have to know it for the written test. So yes, there is some interpolation, and unfortunately we have to know this to work through it to get to the actual written test, but learn how to do takeoff and landing distances in your specific aircraft, because you won't see this image on a check ride, but you will see inside of your POH for a takeoff and landing distance for for your actual check ride. That's why I want you to really know and really understand. Let's look at the next question. So Jason, what changes with ACS? I mean, uh, I saw a post by Rod Machado that it's gonna be very scenario based, is that true? And are the current written tests already up to ACS guidelines? I took mine about first week of May. I'm just curious if that was already ACS. I'm just trying to figure out if I should take my commercial written, you know, before June 13th, if it's still possible before the ACS, because I've been told that it's gonna be far different. So the written tests have been changing over all this time anyways. From private instrument, they've been slowly injecting some new questions, slowly taking out some questions as well. But the 15th is that big official date where we make those 
changes now. And they're hopefully just going to flip a switch. We don't know what will actually unfold that day, but we do know they have been making changes slowly. So you taking it back in May, there's a good chance you saw some of these newer questions already, some questions you haven't perhaps seen before. Now, as a, a part of, do I hustle and try to get it done for the commercial? Listen, this is how it all works now. The reason we have the ACS is, yes, it's all more scenario-based. Good CFIs have been teaching ACS all this time anyways because we've been teaching scenario-based type training. The reason for the changes to the written test is we've been calling it a written test for all this time, but it's really called an FAA knowledge test. Yet we took the knowledge portion out of it when we decided, hey, how many questions and answers can I go in and memorize? And the FAA realized that and said, listen, let's stop making this a who can memorize the most answers. Let's get it back to being a knowledge test. So we're no longer going to release the database, which they haven't done. No, no database to anybody, myself, any of our competitors, nothing like that. And we're going to make the questions more scenario based. So here's the truth behind that is if you know your stuff, you'll be okay. But if you've been prepping for a written test by going in and just memorizing questions, memorizing answers, you're probably in, in for a little bit of trouble. You may pass your test, but you're not going to do as well as you'd like. You're going to be in the 70s somewhere. But if you go in and you truly know your stuff, you don't just memorize it. We know how to apply and correlate these sort of items. You're going to be A-OK. -okay. Look at the test and view the test as a knowledge test, and you're going to be A-OK, -okay, my friend. Let's look at the next question. Jason, I was a student pilot with 100 hours about three years ago. Uh, I stopped right before the written oral and practical test. What do I need to know? So student pilot with 100 hours stopped. Life gets in the way. Remember, we made a whole movie working with Rusty Pilot. So I get your story, my friend. What you need to do is realize that the skill of flying, especially having 100 hours, is going to come back to you faster than you think. But what happens is the principle of disuse sneaks in up here. The knowledge leaves you so fast. The skill is a little bit harder to get rid of. So it'll be easy for you to get back into the cockpit. What's going to be difficult for you is who should I be talking to right now? What kind of airspace am I in right now? What are the VFR visibility and cloud clearance requirements in this airspace again? It's that basic knowledge stuff. So here's what I would do. As you're setting aside more money or letting life just kind of happen and get ready to get back into training, I would start with some sort of ground program and prep with the mindset of let's get ready for the written test or as we should be calling it, the knowledge test. Just like the advice I previously gave, go in and know your stuff. So prep for that written test, prep for that knowledge test. Then once we have that written test, the monkey on our back, off of our back, Let's go get back into the cockpit. I imagine 100 hours, you probably met every single private pilot requirement already. Now it's time to start getting the rust off and getting towards that check ride mindset. So the order I'd go is get the written test done. Let's clear up any medical issues, anything like that that needs to get knocked out. Let's get a written test done, medical in hand. Let's get back in the cockpit and then get into the check ride mindset. That would be my best advice for you. Guys, I hope you'll add me on Snapchat. Username is Jason Shepard. That's how these guys all sent in their questions as well. We're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. You'll see that after this video. You can add us on your social media accounts. We're happy to take your questions uh, any way you'd like to send them. Enjoy the rest of your day. And most importantly, remember that a good pilot is always learning. Have a great day, guys. See ya. Flying again is not just for rusty pilots, but pilots of all experience levels and even those non-pilots. It's the story of someone giving up something they love, aviation, for someone they love. Maybe a child or a spouse. The funny thing about aviation is it always has a way of bringing us back. Join us as we watch these pilots flying again. You are 60 feet over the runway, girl. That is hot. Family is the reason why I got into flying. Family is the reason I stopped flying. And now family is a great reason to start flying again.